All right. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today. Um, it's about one minute after the hour. I think we'll be able to get started. Um, so uh, today, I won't go into time because of our uh, multi-continent broadcast, but we're um, sharing uh, the screen with uh, some uh, brilliant uh, uh, gentlemen from the hospitality industry. Uh, this is a Hedna Revenue Management uh, Series uh, program, and we're very excited today uh, to basically uh, support the continued outreach uh, for our members and for the industry and start sharing a bit more of what's happening and where are we going. Uh, so, uh, without too much ado, I'd like to first get some of the housekeeping out. Um, I'd like to thank Hedna for uh, supporting this event, uh, its members and its sponsors. Uh, Rate Gain is the sponsor of this event, this webinar. And um, we'd like to uh, thank our esteemed guests. Uh, we want to continue to provide access to the industry and thought leaders uh, for guidance and critical thinking now and during most normal conditions too. But um, today, uh, as we get to the reopening, we're joined by three great industry leaders. I've poked a little bit. Uh, two of the panelists are uh, part of the alumni of the HSMAI top industry minds. Um, we will see if they can uh, illustrate that today. Uh, first and foremost, we have Mr. Dave Collier. Thank you, Dave is General Manager, North and South America at OTA Insight. Uh, it's a cloud-based data intelligence platform for the hospitality industry, supporting over 50,000 properties in 168 countries. Mr. Garth Peterson, Managing Director of Ideas. Garth leads the America's sales organization, helping hoteliers drive profitability through better revenue performance. Thank you, Garth. And Morning. Mr. Trevor Stewart Hill, uh, President of Revenue Matters, and that it does, hence the revenue management uh, overlay. He sets the cultural course and provides a strategic direction, oversees the performance for each of Revenue Matters operating groups. Thank you, Trevor, for joining us. Pleasure. Excellent. Um, these are great resources, your great resources. Um, Today, we'd like to discuss a little bit about what you're hearing in the marketplace, what you're seeing from your companies and hearing from partners, um, and kind of start to set the tenor for this uh, next uh, hour. So one of our members, Cleveland Research, mentioned that you know leisure will lead the recovery, uh, followed by corporate, followed by group, we think. Um, recovery will be slow, uh, domestic, and leisure-driven. And what we're starting to see is a little spotty. Um, in China, an, an overused term, uh, green shoots are appearing. Um, so we're starting to feel some comfort that at least people are starting to trust and go out from some of the earnings calls, Hyatt, Marriott, Hilton, all running double digit occupancies in the region. Uh, some of them in resort areas running a much higher occupancy. Anecdotally, from the weekend, high occupancies. So I'd like to, again, now turn it over to you. Um, Dave, you're kind of tapping the measurement with OTA Insights and Triometric. What are you seeing out in the marketplace? Sure, thanks, Dave. First uh, of all, for having, uh, <clears throat> including us here, we're excited to take part today. You know, we've kind of been focused on two areas that we've kind of been watching in terms of market data over the last few weeks. Um, you know, one being hotel open rates and then, you know, the impact of this kind of on the market. And, um, you know, I put together just kind of some, some of the things we've seen week over week over the last seven days, you know, as kind of indicators. And I think, you know, to, to uh, the, the overall theme, the recovery is certainly underway, but, you know, how it'll show up and, and how quickly it'll get here is obviously still debatable. But, We've started to see some some more consistency uh, in the reopenings, which kind of seems to be a little bit of a stepped approach with, you know, group coming back online June 1st, and then a smaller group July, uh, June 15th, and then July 1st, a big push to be at least about 90% in North America. And we're seeing kind of the same trend in EMEA as well, although it's it's stretching a little bit deeper into the summer, and it's got a little bit more of a, you know, multi-step approach there. 
Uh, from a pricing perspective, we're still seeing, you know, there's still volatility in the key markets that we're tracking with, you know, 30 to 40% of hotels still making pricing changes and, and downward pressure on that in the range of generally 10 to 20% um, decrease week over week. Now, I think some of the, the, the better news we've seen is, you know, some of our partner data is that uh, domestic flight search is, is definitely, you know, stronger than international right now. And I think in markets like China and the U.S. where, uh, you know, that opportunity to, um, you know, drive, uh, drive traffic with um, in-country travel is, is going to see a pickup and, and probably speaks to what we saw a little bit over the holiday weekend, right? Um, there is international, the, from a flight search perspective, we are seeing some demand uh, for longer lead times uh, internationally, 90 days plus, and that, that also marries up with some of the transient booking data we're seeing with, you know, uh, windows that are a little bit further out and could suggest, you know, some good recovery in Q3 and Q4. Uh, we're definitely seeing more consistency week over week, right? So I think the markets are settling down, um, you know, hotels are executing their plans and, and slowly but surely making, making some headway. That's, that's kind of a quick uh, view into what we've seen over the past seven days or so. That's great, Dave. Thank you. Garth, uh, do you have any comment, thoughts on this? And uh, again, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks, David. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> if you can see behind me, I'm sitting outside in the north woods of Minnesota. I'm taking a little bit of a break from my vacation today, uh, but happy to do it. It's, it's the new uh, work from home or work remote or from wherever you are. I think it's all, it's all fine now. <laughs> Um, we're seeing a lot of fun stuff, and certainly we've got uh, resources that we continue to publish uh, from ideas, and, and a lot of our clients and prospects in the marketplace are taking advantage of those resources. But you know, from a booking standpoint, I think we're seeing something consistent with what Dave, Dave just mentioned. Uh, we're looking at you know our, our, our installation base over kind of a trailing seven-day basis. I was just checking numbers this morning. We're seeing a 13% increase in on-the-books, uh, you know, bookings for you. Know, future window here uh, booked in the last seven days. So there is, there is distinct booking activity occurring. Uh, and like Dave kind of mentioned, we're seeing it definitely for June, July uh, is the majority of where that's dropping. And then it kind of softens up for the following uh, 60 to 90 days. And then we're seeing actually a little bit of bump in bookings a little farther out for December. So there's kind of a, a strange gap that's occurring. People want to travel right now or they want to travel later but they're, I feel like they're managing their risk in the uncertainty in that, in that medium term booking window kind of between now and the balance of the year. And do you think policies are starting to help with that? The way hotels are setting their future policies and rules. What's in the minds of the traveler and, and what's <laughs> going to be their motivations is, is difficult. I, I can kind of speak from my own experiences as a litmus test, but, um, you know, I've got a friend that's at this uh, cabin now who flew here from Phoenix and he had a nearly full flight coming from Phoenix to Minneapolis. Uh, there was no such thing as a vacant middle seat by policy. And I think that, you know, we talk about, and maybe we'll talk about it some more in this call is, you know, hotels and, and gapping some of the rooms. And I think that's a great idea um, in theory. And if it's going to drive someone's confidence or trust factor, fine. But I think those are short-term business decisions. The second there's demand to fill those seats or fill those rooms, I think owners and operators are going to fill them. And then we need to think about what's, what's the next reaction from the consumer behavior on once those feel-good factors aren't, aren't happening anymore. Hey, thanks, sir. Trevor, um, you're feeling the pulse directly at the property. Can you share a little bit too? Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks for having me too. And, and David, um, appreciate the question. I think, you know, we have out, out of the 70 some odd properties that we support from a revenue management pricing and distribution perspective, we have uh, 17 now 20 open. Uh, so I have a bit of an understanding of what's happening. Most of those properties we're finding that are open are going to be in Midwestern states. Um, I think as both Dave and Garth have alluded to, the drive market is pretty strong. Uh, we mm -hmm. saw some very, very strong occupancies over the uh, Memorial Day weekend. Um, I was on a, um, a panel with uh, vacation professional vacation rental managers as well, and they were saying, especially in the southeastern U.S. in particular, uh, they had very, very strong last-minute demand coming in uh, into those markets. 
And interestingly enough, also some of the larger units, maybe it might be a function of availability, but you know, four to six bedroom homes are being booked uh, last minute, uh, which also is, a, I think, um, an indicator to me that people are wanting to travel with friends and family um, and, and just get away and, and, and escape a little bit. So <clears throat> I think that's bearing out. I think, um, you know, as we talk about some of the, the you had asked the question of, of the political environment. I think if we're to take a look at different regions of the country, I think behavior is very a function of, of the region that you're in. So if you're in New England, things are very shut down. We have a property that's open there with a theory that they would have, um, you know, one of the only properties that are open, so they would capture all the demand. There just isn't any demand. And conversely, we have um, properties in more rural or secondary or tertiary markets um, in, in other locations where attitudes are a little bit more open and uh, they're seeing tremendous, uh, tr tremendous performance. And I think Garth is exactly right. We're seeing a short-term business and then we're seeing some some um, uh, really August and beyond, we're starting to see some pickup during that time as well. That's great, and I appreciate that. Uh, obviously, not everything is going to be equal. Um, can I get a feeling from you where you think there are going to be successes, um, whether it's by segment, whether it's by star rating, uh, price, location? We started to touch on it a little bit, even comparing, contrasting. Uh, extended stay or some of these uh, changes that might be necessary to facilitate a longer stay in some properties. I don't, Dave, do you want to start at the top, talk about maybe some segments, and then we'll work our way back again through? Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, some of the um, the economy in mid-scale uh, segments are doing very well, uh, even up in mid-scale. You know, I think it's a byproduct of, you know, a lot of that is, um, you know, highway locations are doing well. There's a lot of grocery and a lot of commerce being moved still. Um, you know, I can kind of anecdotally attest driving from uh, Colorado to Arizona this week, even just seeing the shift from state to state, you know, uh, New Mexico is still relatively locked down and moving into Arizona, which is pretty wide open. You know, you can definitely see, um, you know, you, even in that kind of proximity, different attitudes that are driving some of that change and a lot more. You know, just the anecdote of the parking lot's a lot fuller at, at um, you know, hotels that I noticed on the ride out. So it definitely kind of supports what we're seeing the strength there with, you know, luxury still trailing behind. The anecdotally, we've, we've also heard extended stay doing very well. And I think, you know, probably a couple of different root cause, right? Is it folks that are shelter in place and that's where they were? Or is it, you know, kind of first responder and medical personnel, you know, entrenching in for some long stays? I think there's still a little bit debate of, you know, long term, you know, who, where, you know, will that trend persist? Um, but definitely been a, been a strong, uh, you know, segment as well, you know, over the last few weeks, at least. Great. And, and luxury, I mean, Garth, what are you seeing from your, your clients? Again, some of them very high end luxury brands, casinos, et cetera. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm not seeing a lot uh, of movement in, from that sector yet. Um, a lot of those folks are still closed or in very small occupancies and, you know, shell staffs. I'm, I'm anxious to see um, some of these segmentations recovering. Cause I think that'll, I think that'll put more rooms into some of that upper scale and, and luxury segments. I'm thinking particularly about business travel. Uh, you know, I think Trevor is probably on the right track, you know, after kind of leisure gets comfortable moving around, you know, when will business travel come back? And I was just looking at the GPTA, survey that they completed a week ago uh, and they said 54 percent of all the travel companies that they that they surveyed said that they're going to start traveling again for business in the near future you know so 54 percent of these travel managers are saying we're going on the road again we're going to kind of resume some normal operations but there was no specifics of course around exactly when the near term future was or exactly what conditions would have to satisfy but there's there's certainly um, a desire and a demand to travel again within the corporate travel. And I think that will give rise to a, some more normalized uh, hotel occupancies in that upper upscale and, and uh, luxury segment. Yeah. Uh, I'll just chime in there as well. If you think about this demand, uh, curtail demand that we're seeing here, it's, it's coming from um, restrictions on demand. It's not coming from demand fundamentals, right? So yeah, that's a absolutely. A decade ago where we had the economic downturn, it was really fund fundamentally demand challenges there. There was some knock on and protracted um, unemployment rates, things like that. We have very high unemployment today, but I think it's a spike and we're gonna see 
a return to business very rapidly. From a travel perspective, we're projecting the smaller companies are likely to begin traveling first. The larger companies are probably going to be a little bit more conservative in terms of um, putting processes and, and protocols in place before allowing their travelers out in the, out in the market. So um, that's something to look, look forward uh, to as well. And then, um, David, you had asked, or you had started out the conference call this morning with regards to uh, Cleveland Research, and I fundamentally agree that leisure will start first. I think some smaller uh, corporate travel will begin to, um, to take hold in, in the latter part of the summer and early fall. I think uh, we're going to see a spike in group recovery, and the reason I say that is a lot of groups have actually booked in the spring, have actually pushed their uh, meetings back and, and what have you into the fall months. So statistically, even though it's not necessarily new bookings coming in into the fall, it's just um, moved bookings. We're going to see a, maybe an artificial inflation of, of group recovery um, in the fall. And then in terms of larger groups, we're seeing really the, the bigger meetings and bigger, bigger groups moving into 2021 um, versus, uh, versus the fall. There's still a little bit of hesitation on the part of large conferences to take uh, um, to, to continue forward with their commitments in the fall. Well, to your point, fear is going to be a great limiter. Law, you know, being in, in some lockdown or, or semi-lockdown uh, position, some of the major markets like New York and uh, the tri-state area now trying to open in a, a regimented fashion where, like you said, you know, Arizona is is open. L.A. is starting to open in the beginnings of green shoots again in California. Um, a lot of our members and, and partners are, 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 you know, furloughed or, or, or not gainfully employed. And, you know, travel hospitality took a major hit. Um, the marketplace uh, took a hit. And now all of a sudden, um, the wealthier are getting wealthier with the, the, the market, right? So some will have, some won't. How do you see the business mix of properties? Where are they starting to focus? Like, are city properties looking differently at their business mix than secondary tertiary markets or are OTAs friends again? Maybe I'd ask that question. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I, I, I think, um, I think the industry is a, in a very unique position where if you take, take a look at the mantra or the, the drumbeat of book direct, um, it, it really wasn't significantly meaningful other than maybe I get a few more points or I get a couple discounts on the rate or something along those lines. But what was my incentive as a consumer to book, book direct? I think that the climate has changed a little bit there where that, that message would probably resonate more now than ever in the past, because really what I'm looking for as a traveler would be three things. I think I'm looking for safety. What, what can I safely participate in when I get to my destination? What's, what's open, what's closed, what are the hours of the operation, what are the, the protocols, what do I need to bring with me, what is supplied, things like that. The second is going to be around the theme of sanitation. So, you know, do I have visible um, evidence that, that where I'm going is, is highly sanitized? Uh, my wife will love that. She's a germaphobe. And so the world is now <laughs> revolving around her, her wishes, which is good, I guess. And then the third is gonna be around flexibility. Right. So, you know, if I'm going to get change of plans, can I get out of there? You know, what type of rate plans are going to be available to me where I can where I can make modifications, et cetera. So those are the three themes that are out there. If you look at the first theme, what can I safely do? What are the hours of operation? What are the protocols? What are the things? To, the local property is going to know that they're going to know if a, if a park down the street, what the operating hours are, if there's you know, issues related to hiking and what, what you need to do on the trail. So just a lot of good detailed information that a property might have. So I might be incentivized now to call the property and get all that good information before I go on the, on the trip. Um, on the other hand, OT, OTAs are in a very unique position to be able to be a, a resource and a, and a, um, a helpful advocate for me if I'm going to be going on a more complex trip. So if I'm going to be flying to Europe and I'm going to be going on a train and I'm going to be staying in hotels and I'm going to maybe go on a cruise ship or what have you, it's going to be nice to know either I have a traditional brick and mortar travel agent that I can 
call that has my, my best interest at heart with an after hours service center, or maybe I've got an OTA that um, uh, I have a relationship with and, and they can maybe proactively tell me that, hey, you know, Brussels airport has had a bit of an outbreak, so we're gonna reroute you through Berlin. I'm not gonna be calling QC Terma in Rome or a Marriott in Paris to ask for help with my en route travel. And so that's where the OTA really, um, really has some strength. And so the interplay of those two elements, I guess, is, is ultimately what's going to drive, uh, drive how, how a guest books in the future. Uh, I, th I think there's, you know, if you look at game theory, there is a, there is a way for all parties to win. Uh, if we retract and go back to our old ways of thinking where we're being protectionistic, where maybe, um, players, I'm not going to point to which side, players are moving away from rate parity. There's, there's pressure on, on uh, suppliers for uh, discounts that are exclusive. There's margin plays. If some of that stuff continues to happen, then, you know, gloves are coming off. And I don't, you know, it'll be interesting to watch <laughs> and be involved with, frankly. Right. But I, there, is a, there is a play where, where all parties can, can have a role. Um, I just don't know if, as an industry, collectively, we're um we're ready for that uh for, for that um cooperative cooperative approach cooperation oh, yeah. garth yeah. thank you <laughs> garth cooperative <you're> approach <laughs> david what would you like me to comment on from that <laughs> no i was just wondering if you were seeing any you know pricing changes strategy changes in business mix um the drive direct discussion there right so are you seeing that or are you seeing any uh, more bonuses that they're giving out? We talked at one point about uh, some hotels selling futures, right? That you could pay now and, and get a better price or a better price later. And the value of this buy now is higher later, right? Are those types of scenarios in this unprecedented market, are you seeing anything like that? I'm seeing just a little bit right now of the, you know, pay me some money now and get a higher value. It's basically uh, a, a fancy phrase for what is a gift card. I mean, you, you, you pay a hundred, but you get a $125 gift card. And that's not a new idea, uh, but it's kind of getting some traction right now. And in, in some of these hotels that are trying to drive a little cash in the front door and happy to, you know, have you redeem it later. For the hotel, there's always going to be some breakage, and there's, uh, I mean, in theory, it's a good idea, but I'm just concerned that it's probably not really on scale going to make a huge impact to the industry right now. Um, so I'm seeing just a little bit of that now, but I'm, I'm not seeing that pervasively uh, as I'm out in the market and talking to people and looking online all day, every day. Pricing strategies are people holding their rates, or they dropping rate and hope that some demand yeah. will create. You know, you know, I, I feel like, well, and, and Dave mentioned it earlier that some of what they're seeing in, in their data is 10 to 20% uh, kind of slough in rates. And that feels about accurate to me. And I, I actually think that's pretty good. I, I feel good about that. It's only that level. Uh, Cause I think look at past downturns, Mm. Um, you know, 08, 09, 2001, those, those were not true statements. And we really dropped quickly and then try to dig out of that. Um, so I'm feeling actually a little bit better about some of the rates that I'm seeing as I kind of shop around some of our clients and some of my prospects, uh, what they're doing with rates for some future dates, you know, July, August, September. I'm not seeing crazy rates. I mean, I'm, certainly there's examples of that. But by and large, I'm feeling better about people's um, – kind of got to hold on to rate a little bit mm. um, for maybe some value adds, maybe some reasonable, you know, demand-based pricing, not, not huge discounts uh, or incentives. So I'm right. feeling good about it as an industry. Ter Trevor, what do you got in yeah, your no, portfolio? I, I agree with you. I think um, we're seeing a lot more sort of value adds versus straight discounting, or maybe there's some upgrade incentives to different uh, unit types. So you're, yeah capitalizing on some additional average rate from existing demand. But I, what, what, I, what I am concerned about is industry benchmarking. There's a couple of factors here that we need to be aware of as we're looking at benchmarking and take it with a grain of salt. So when it comes to average rate, keep in mind that 
if, if it holds true that luxury segments can be the last one to recover, we're seeing a lot of extended stay business. As an industry, it looks like it's going to look to us as though the average rate is depressed and, and the, um, a lot of analysts and others out there just assume that's related to pricing moves. It isn't necessarily going to be related to pricing moves. It's going to be related to a function of product utilization, right? So that's, that's the first thing. So average rate's going to look lower than it really is. The second is kind of coming back, Garth, what you said earlier about this, um, you know, occupancy levels. What, what is truly an available room or available unit today? You know, as, as we're looking at putting in some, some buffers in between uh, guest checkout and guest arrival, right. when, we start, when we start doing that, your effective occupancy levels based on capacity is going to be much higher than what's being reported. And if you're from a benchmarking perspective, not uh, factoring in those out of order rooms and treating those as available rooms, um, that's going to be uh, severely understating occupancy as well. So we're going to be in a situation where we're seeing both um, evidence of, of protracted occupancy uh, lows, and we're also going to see evidence of, of lowering average rate when we look at, in, at the industry at large. And so we need to almost ignore that and take a look at a property by property, market by market um, basis, what's actually happening in reality and sort of manage to that versus, versus what we might see through other reporting. Dave Collier, you've got that omniscient view. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I think you know, a lot of the same uh, things have been mentioned by, by uh, Garth and Trevor, definitely seeing some experimentation in the market, but nothing really at scale. Um, you know, one kind of trend we are seeing is, you know, really a, a bit of an uptick in, in direct bookings uh, done locally at the hotels. But I think that's a bit of a byproduct of, um, you know, I think Travis are just feeling less pressure to plan ahead. You know, I'm not sure that's a trend that's going to stick around uh, very long and in line with the very short booking windows we're seeing. But imagine, you know, that we've already said there's new scene, there's other indicators suggesting that'll start to space itself out, but otherwise pretty consistent, uh, you know, with all the other comments. Uh, so drive direct exists probably because that's where the demand is going to be in the short term, um, especially when you're driving, uh, you're going to know the market uh, to a certain extent. Um, and I understand the Google is very helpful in this process. Um, so it's not very complex travel yet either. So right. It's, it's, it's going to stay simple for a little while. Well, and, and also the limitations. Um, the UK has specified that if you, you travel over there, which they're starting to enable, you're ha going to have to quarantine for 14 days currently. Um, most Americans only get 14 days uh, for vacation. So it might be difficult to go on holiday and, and quarantine. Um, with that, turning rooms, we talked about it and the extended stay vision and how are hotels, especially those that have to make that decision of, am I going to open up because I think I could get above 30% occupancy or am I going to stay closed and, and, and wait for a bigger market recovery because of the expense, right? Um, do we think that there's going to be some adjustment in, in technologies and the way we're managing rooms and inventory to provide the buffers to enable part of your facility to be more extended stay or healthcare focused. Have you, you seen anything around that guys? I don't know, Garth, Trevor. Well, I, I don't, I don't know that I've got a, a sense, David, of what people are doing for healthcare rooms or trying to convert some of their facility to be extended stay. I mean, there's entire brands and segments for that. So it's a tough road to hoe to try to magically convert part of your hotel to determining to open though determining you know is it 30 yeah, yeah yeah so let me let me think about that for a second because that's a that's a difficult question to answer and it's going to be different for everybody but the way i would think about it would be are you comfortable losing less uh right so right now you're closed you're losing money you're losing all your your fixed expenses when you open you're going to now increase variable expenses but get some revenue against it you know, could you continue losing about the same amount of money being open? Would you lose more money being open or lose less money being open? Mm. And so some of, some of the commercial um, skill set and um, business acumen around not just revenue forecasting or occupancy forecasting, but doing some profit forecasting. 
and leveraging some of your your headcount, whether it's a revenue manager or sales leader, to think about you know profit forecasting and what are all the variable expenses that we're going to incur when we open, and so that's kind of step one. And then step two is thinking about that ramp. So if you need to practice turning the house, uh, practice cleaning, it's a lot easier to figure that out when you're doing it 10, 15, 20% than doing it for 80%. And, and so if you can uh, work out the commercials, personally, I'd probably open and get good at running a smaller occupancy before you actually have to ramp and scale that. Yeah, because there's, there's going to be a downward pressure on profit with all the additional cleaning, additional, you know, safety measures and training protocols, we're going to put yeah. in, mm -hmm. all the protocols. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know how long those kind of protocols will last or be in place, but it's definitely going to have a downward pressure on profit. I, I don't know, Garth. In some cases, I think um, properties have figured out a way to operate more leanly than they have in the past. So if you take a look at you know the Bear Stearns Price Waterhouse. Wow study back in 2008, 2009, during the financial crisis, the break-even formula was sort of in the high 40s to almost 55% range. And then if you take a look at um, some studies that were done more recently, it seems like it's hovering more around the, call it 40% range in terms yeah. of occupancy. But, you know, to, to your point, if you think about, you know, an individual property, you know, how do we come up with this formula? It's probably the simplest way to do it is to say, take your, take your fixed costs. Let's start with variable costs. Your variable costs now, you can't necessarily rely on old, old P&L data to help you understand that, but figure out what your variable costs are as a, as a percentage of revenue, right? So start with that. Then take your, yeah. take your cost divided by one minus your variable cost as a percentage of your revenue. That's going to give you your revenue break even. And then you have to figure out from there, that's my revenue break even, what percentage of, of that is gonna be rooms and what percentage of that is gonna be ancillary revenue, revenue. So once you have your rooms, then you can then very easily figure out what your RevPAR is gonna look like. And then based on that RevPAR, you can then determine, okay, if I'm gonna be at 10% lower average rates than maybe I was before, if, if that's what the market's gonna bear, what does that mean in terms of occupancy percentage? And that's how you're gonna to get to your occupancy to say, hey, do we feel good yep. enough about about that occupancy to open or not? So I think there is a a more sort of direct approach to, to understanding is it viable to open and when is it viable to open? And it sounds like it's going to be more introspective than starting to look around and see what the market's doing. Yeah, that that plays a part in it, but I need to really focus on my own P&L, my own business right now. Yeah, yeah and, and I think the other side of that equation is what's the supply looking like right so we've got some properties that are coming out of the ground that we're working with at this point and that hasn't stopped they're still planning no. on out of the ground right yeah you need to understand what the new supply is that's coming into the market but also we've got another uh group of properties in a particular market that's being very restrictive around hospitality and they've decided to not reopen as a hotel they're going to reopen as something else and so just understanding you, your local market is going to be important but i think you're right looking at your own navel <laughs> and determining what makes, what makes sense for you as individual, it, it's going to be the right way to approach this. Is that a new hospitality term, the navel, or you know, <laughs> like the donut and bookings, right? Look, oh, look, look introspectively. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dave. What What are you thinking about comparing, you know, parity and all the market conditions and? Uh, market insights coming out and all these things that are happening now. What do, what do you, you think? Uh, I guess, you know, a couple of thoughts on that. I think just to support some of the previous comments, we're, we're hearing groups too, kind of really putting together pretty comprehensive playbooks on reopening as well to try to be able to absorb you know, some of the local and potential regulatory requirements that they have, you know, whether it be constraints on, you know, to the point on, uh, can people get out to restaurants, right? What's food service going to look like? Those, those elements and try to anticipate, you know, kind of all the, the choose your own adventure questions that hotel's going to have to go through in, in Rio. Mm -hmm. um, you know, parity, interestingly enough, has not been, you know, a lot of, um, I haven't heard too much talk about that. I think it's been put to a degree on the, 
on the back burner, but I think it, um, I think the consensus is that it can return very quickly as a, uh, as a topic. And I think you know, we've certainly interacted with a couple of groups that, that are seeing issues and, and starting to address that. I think that's just gonna be a bit of a sliding scale uh, in terms of, you know, when that returns. Uh, us personally, we've, we've kind of shifted a lot of our, we've taken a look at our roadmap over the last um, you know, 90 days to really understand are there things that we can be doing to aid the market recovery. So we've reprioritized, not necessarily working on anything different, but just the order with which we're working, we're working on projects, um, you know, to really focus on, you know, where can we d develop products or enhance products with more future looking data um, and, and particularly, you know, market driven data that might show those, you know, again, infamous green shoots, uh, but really understand what, what's changed in terms of the demand curve, where is it coming from? Um, what do those windows look like? What type of traveler personas are included so that, um, you know, it can be a little bit less dependent on, on um, uh, you know, backward looking data, which isn't going to be real reliable in the short term. Right. Unprecedented. So we've got to kind of take a look at our navel, as Trevor called it, and, and start to look at the existing market. Um, do you think systems and data are going to play a bigger part going forward? as we start to recover, or do you think it's still too early to say we're still in the tunnel, we're, we're not really sure? I personally think it's gonna be key. I mean, particularly with, you know, we're all well aware of, you know, the furlough activity that's taking place across the industry. So, you know, candidly, everyone's being asked to do more with less. I mean, the revenue managers are looking after bigger portfolios, a lot more responsibility. Um, I, I don't see a scenario where you can't be system data driven coming out of this. and. For a couple of reasons. I mean, first off, you know, there's going to be a whole set of kind of short term KPIs that need to be put in place. You know, like some of the things we talked about, right, in terms of when's the right time to reopen, um, how do you staff back up on your hotel? And then, you, you know, once you get through the, let's call it, you know, the, the rest of this quarter in Q3, when we get to more of a steady state, what are the longer term KPIs that are put in place? And again, data is going to be a big, uh, big part of that. And it's also going to need to be, um, it's going to be important for us to understand those you know, those changes in travel behavior and data is going to tell us a lot of that. What is consumer sentiment like? Are people comfortable getting on a plane again? Um, you know, how far are they willing to go? How far are they, you know, willing to be away from home if something were to occur and they try to make their way home? And I don't think we know all that yet. So data is going to play a real key in helping understand, again, who are those new personas and, you know, what's the, the right part of the market to, uh, to pursue. And then again, obviously a staged approach as business travel comes back. I think everyone agrees that there's definitely pent up demand there, but you know, particularly on the sales side, who are they going to go see our corporate organizations open? Can they get, you know, through the front door to see their contact? Does the trip even make sense if your contacts, you know, work from home for the next, uh, you know, eight months? So I think there's still some, you know, really um, a lot of question marks and, and data and systems are going to be key to understanding that. Garth, are, do, are you seeing a real utilization of revenue management systems now with unprecedented, you know, situations? Um, or are they, you know, set it and hope it works kind of thing? What, what are you seeing on the technology side? That's a great question. And we talk a lot about that, obviously, in the four walls of ideas. But it's, it, it's giving us some really mixed sentiment you can see in the marketplace around not just revenue management technology, but the need of revenue management at all. Uh, and I've certainly seen some, some press around uh, high caliber professionals saying things like, we don't need revenue managers and we don't need revenue management technology. And then I've got, that, that, that's really a hold up. I see that in the press, which is you know headlining, but I'm not seeing that from certainly our clients and, and even prospects that are, that are hopeful ideas customers. Because you know my my business is still pretty rich right now, of people that have the 100% opposite opinion of the example I just gave, where they're saying this is the best time to lean into, you know, some AI and, and forecasting capabilities with revenue management technology, because we don't know. It, it, one of my personal revenue management mantras is less guessing, mm. which is with a lot of what you get with with manual forecasting, and right the uncertainty is so strong right now that let's get some programmatic data driven way to start looking at real time bookings in future in your future pace and start formulating a forecast and you can always amend that you can always add some influence as that you know, personal expert of your background and your market and your hotel you should do that you should lean into it 
so that's mostly what I'm seeing, David, is is that kind of behavior and not the example that I gave from from press about three weeks ago. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Trevor, did you want to comment? or Because I was going to ask about the silos, right? Revenue management, marketing, sales, operations, and how yeah. they need to be broken down in order to take care of the, the staff, the guest, and the property, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I want to key in on something that, that Garth had mentioned and what he's hearing in the, in the press and others about you know, the argument that, hey, there's no revenue, so we don't need revenue management. And I think that short-sighted view comes from maybe how you define revenue management. So I, I define revenue management as a business process that's designed to optimize the performance of your asset through all market conditions, right? So whether it's strong or, or weak. Mm-hmm. And, there, and if you think about it in terms of a business process, right? So coming back to the, the data, as, as David answered, data is going to be really important. Um, the right data, it, it's going to be absolutely inc- incredibly important and you need to track. And what are we tracking? And then once you've got the tracking, then you're going to forecast what does that future man look like? And then once you have that, then you're looking at three things. You're looking at pricing, you're looking at inventory management, and then you're looking at distribution. So distribution as a, as a function in there that's vital. And then you've yeah. got internal, internal communication. So the best laid plans of mice and man will off go awry, right? So think <laughs> about that. Now, you know, how are we communicating these strategies um, how are we participating in various channels? What, what's our pricing strategy? What's our, uh, you know, in the reservations office, what's our fade strategy, if anything? What's our upsell incentive, if, if anything? Um, all of those things have to be factored in. And then you start the cycle all over again. So, hey, did we make a bonehead mistake or did we do the right things? And then we can start that cycle over at that point. Yep. Um, if you have revenue management in that definition, it's definitely a vital arm. Uh, you, you need sales, you need marketing, you need operations, you need, need all of it. And if, and if they're operating in silos, you're going to be dead in the water. You have to be much more innovative, creative. Um, if you go back to the old ways yep. of doing things and you open your front door, just say, hey, we're exactly the same property that we were, but now we have face shield at the front desk and, and we have evidence of, of cleaning protocols and we're using, right. we're using sort of the, the safe, clean care mantra in our properties as, as sort of this branded differentiator. <laughs> which is kind of likened to the, the betting wars from 10 years ago. Um, if, if you're just doing that, then you're not going to be innovating and you're not going to see, you're not going to be able to um, effectively compete uh, as we emerge from this crisis. So you need to think much more innovatively. And the only way you can do that is to break down those silos. Well, well I was going to oh, add, please, I was going to add, David, it's like what Trevor said, what do you need? You need to, be communicating and we're getting out of your silos, but I mean, just kind of almost religiously or culturally, you got to think about, you need to have a positive attitude and you need to have a sense of urgency. Yeah. Let's, let's get in there and you get, and revenue management is a process. It's, it's, you don't do it once you do it continually. And so the kind of conversations you have, especially right now, things are changing so quickly. The notion of a weekly yield meeting, I think is comical. You got to be revenue managing, kind of 24 hours a day <laughs> uh, something you know, think if, if that was what was needed then what becomes realistic for you to deliver on so start backing up and what can you do but once a week guys isn't enough um, you're looking at your distribution plan your maps your profitability how, how, how are you forecasting there's manually or with an automated system review it challenge it update it it's you gotta get at it in you know one of my biggest pet peeves is when someone says oh well let's schedule a meeting you know, I talk about this next week. I'm like, well, it's, it's Monday. Why don't we schedule a meeting tomorrow to talk about it? Like, you got to get on it. And because it, it, I tell you what, it's going to be a lot more fun. You know, if you can have fun in this time period right now, it's going to be a lot more fun managing the upslope than it is managing the downslope. So a good revenue manager is going to make a property a lot of money if they're paying attention and doing a good job. And as Trevor suggested, collaborating and, and communicating with all the other departments, uh, sales, marketing, and others. Excellent advice. Um, so now making that decision to open up, realizing that revenue management and pricing are important in, in this time, managing that business mix, and also figuring out the, the safety protocols that you're going to be, be managing in, um, do you see that, you know, with the demand windows that are set up right now, that they seem to be, you know, uh, in certain markets, short and isolated, um, 
do you think that the the real decision to to get out into the market and to start marketing again is going to start to come sooner or, or later and how will that tie into your your positioning of revenue management st specific offers packages with healthcare or insurance type programs things like that Trevor do you want to start yeah that's there's a lot there's a lot in that question um, yeah sorry no that's okay i'll i'll just uh Pick any one element, Trevor, and just go with it. <laughs> start, right. start, start at the navel, right? Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> Work uh, your way up. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 there was a couple things that came to mind, and, and I don't know if it's because I haven't had my second cup of coffee, but uh, um, let me think on that just a little bit longer, and then rest assured I'll chime in. Yeah, excellent. Then I'll, I'll, I'll switch back to Garth. <laughs> What do you think? Yeah, I think the smart yeah. properties are going to be spending some money on on marketing, and you know we're seeing. I'm seeing in a couple of different sources now that there's a little bit of a shift in marketing spend away from maybe some of the more traditional, um, you know, advertising dollars and being smarter about upgrading their website, upgrading some of their other, you know, digital capabilities or digital campaignings uh, to try to make sure that they're visible for mm. the travelers that are present currently. Mm. Uh, for, for those immediate bookings and, and frankly visible for the travelers that are kind of dreaming and looking a little farther out and beyond, and beyond the normal booking curve. You, you got to be there and present and, and you can't turn off the marketing entirely. Um, but, you know, so I, I'll give you an advanced um, glimmer into a survey uh, results. I just saw that it will come to market here in the next week or so. Uh, they polled hoteliers who said in top part of the survey, that marketing was their number one place they were cutting variable expense. But then it, once you peel back the layers and looked at the actual categories of marketing spend, uh, they were in fact not <laughs> reducing mm -hmm. marketing spend. They were just kind of moving it around a little bit uh, in some low return areas into high return areas, or frankly, that were some deficit areas in their broader marketing plan previously. I think smart hoteliers are also going to want to rethink marketing, right? So what's worked in the past may not work in the future. There's probably a, a requirement for different messages. Um, and then how are those messages communicated, right? So now, now we're gonna think about distribution as a, as a function of marketing. Um, and, and what are some yep. of the things that we have in the various distribution channels to, to uh, around, around policies and around cleanliness regimes, around safety, those, sa those three themes that I had mentioned earlier in the conversation, um, getting those out in a little, little deeper way through distribution channels is going to be important. What does give me encouragement, though, is if you take a look at every shock to the to our industry, as we're coming out of, uh, maybe in the midst of the shock, and as we're coming out of the uh, of the event itself, we've always, as an industry, underestimated performance, always. And so, what's going to be kind of interesting now is. I think we're probably underestimating performance, so we might be a little more conservative as it relates to marketing spend. But as Garth said, I think now is an ex exactly the right time. And I think consumers are ready to hear it. They weren't ready to hear it probably a month ago or, or six weeks ago. There's no way. It'd be the, absolutely the wrong thing to do is to try start stimulating interest in travel. Um, I think we're now past that, we're past the trough, and, and now is an excellent time to, to get a jump start on, on marketing initiatives, but you need to think about it a little bit differently. Well, there was a lot of marketing. I mean, uh, there were screen savers that were coming out galore, kind of like Garth's screen saver now, right? But um, <laughs> there were a lot of screen savers for destinations and the aspirational piece to help you escape sure. what you were, you were living. Um, this is a science driven lockdown. It, it, it's not because of, we had some headwinds in the market we saw earlier. Um, we, we started to hear that at some of the early investment conferences that uh, we were part in like Alice. Um, I, I think the interest really is um, you've got to make this decision as hoteliers. Uh, am I uh, believing in my, my property, my market, my proposition? Am I priced properly? Am I using the right distribution? And do I have the right messaging from content informing the guests that they'll have security, uh, both from a, a healthcare perspective, 
um, that it is safe to travel again. They could reduce their fear. And I think we're starting to see those green shoots with the, the early drivers going out and exploring their marketplace. And I can even bet that there are some small family bubbles that are being created where parents are kind of trusting in, in, in family to go and have a private night out or an excursion. Are you seeing any opportunities like that to blend the rate room combination with the marketing and the healthcare to create more stay and play type offers and opportunities, things that would allow you to open up even at a, a lower occupancy, but to start that supply chain again, to get your property listed on the OTAs, on, on the Google, et cetera. Do you, what do you think about starting to push that way now? Um, Trevor, do you want to? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in two minds about it, uh, David, honestly. Um, one is backyard marketing is going to be the way to go. Who, who knows me as, as a supplier? Who trusts me? Who, who would be my guest? Um, asking those questions first. And then saying, what's really relevant to that particular audience? And then catering to that through, through, um, through packaging, through, through marketing initiatives, through incentives, et cetera, would, would probably be the, the smartest, way, smartest way to go. If you're going to get um, ultra creative, um, then that's cool. Uh, <laughs> try it. But I wouldn't pin my hopes on being, um, you know, Guests, guests have faced a lot of change over the last couple of weeks. And I think what they're looking for is something that, what can I count on? What, what's gonna, what, what can I rely on that's going to help me uh, rejuvenate and, and refresh and escape and whatever those motivations are? Um, start, start with that. And if you, get, um, if you get a base of business coming that way, then, then be, absolutely it begins experimenting with other, other, other options as well. But um, the more confusing you make it for somebody, the more apt they're going to say no. So keep it simple. You changing any of your descriptive in the, your website and your GDS talking about new health protocols, your content, right? Yeah, it's starting to happen. Garth, and what I find really interesting, sorry, is a lot of brands and management companies are coming up with this this sort of um, proprietary branding of their cleanliness. Mm -hmm. which I find interesting. Um, will it be a differentiator when you're using the exact same words in the logo? You know, uh, you know, the self, the, the safe, the clean, the care, and those are coming through. I'm not sure in the consumer's mind if it's going to be differentiated. Weren't you clean before? No. Um, we've got a, a, a few minutes left. Uh, I, I want to give you guys an opportunity to kind of sum up your, your, your message. Um, obviously, there's a message from your business. There's also the, the personal message to many of our, our members and friends in the industry. Um, Dave, do you want to just start and, and, and kind of share what are the things that you really want the marketplace to take away? Um, well, I think at a high level, a couple of things, obviously, we're, you know, a data company. So that's what we, you know, wake up and think about every day. So, you know, just an, important to review your data sources. You know, Trevor said it, that, you know, the right data is important. So, you know, again, as you build out your KPIs and you, you measure and track those, you know, make sure you've got reliable sources for it. Figure out how to get more granular. Again, as we talked about, there's a lot of conjecture in terms of <clears throat> what may or may not happen. I think that example around cleanliness is a great uh, Great starting point. I don't think we have enough consumer feedback to understand what that ideal package looks like. I think there's some great guesswork happening in terms of a starting point, but that's going to evolve. So, right, loyalty and other feedback channels are going to be important to understand um, how people think. And marrying up those those data points, the anecdotal with the empirical, is going to be really important. Again, I mentioned earlier. I think you know short-term goals are going to be really you know critical through the summer months in particular. Um, and then, you know, once predictable patterns come back, really, you know, how, understand how has your market been redefined in terms of your competitive set? Um, is it truly who you're competing against or is there a new, new market emerging around you depending on constraints on air travel and, and restaurants and, um, you know, business travel? There's a lot of things that are going to go into that. Um, and then, you know, everyone's being pushed to do more with less. So I think, you know, just take a look at, you know, obviously a couple of us are on the vendor side, but take a look at your partners and see what more they can do for you. A lot of the 
lot of you know folks are paying for stuff that you know technology that's underutilized today. Find out, you know, spend some time on that blocking and tackling, and understand that there are other sources that you're you know already have readily available that you can take advantage of. And I think you know all of us have created some free resource centers. Take advantage of that data, you know, just see what's out there and figure out how to package that together so you can make, you know, particularly now, just some really good short-term decisions, and then figure out what can translate into longer-term strategy. Great. Garth, any last comments or thoughts? Do you have a resource center like yep. uh, OTA Insights? No. Yep, yep. There's plenty of good stuff on there, uh, ideas.com. But kind of go back to one of my comments from a little bit ago is be ready for the upslope. It's coming. I think we lost him to a bear. No. And I, I think back okay. to a story from our last down to a new or nearly new client of, of ideas was. Yes. The great North has claimed you Garth. Um, we didn't hear all of that. I apologize. And there wasn't the bear. I was just joking. Um, Trevor, any last minute comments, thoughts? Yeah, just a couple. Um, I wrote down a, a couple as you asked the question there. One was, um, Good. Um, you know, don't panic. Just take one day at a time. Uh, demand absolutely is going to return. It'll probably come back much faster than anybody is projecting just based on, on past history. It's all, we've always recovered much more rapidly than uh, what we've projected as an industry. Um, I also, I, I think now's a great time to think differently, you know, the way old ways of doing things um, aren't going to cut it moving forward. So now's a great time to collaborate internally with other departments, but also externally with distribution partners and, and others to make sure that when we come out of this, we're coming out in a healthy, supportive way, in a, in a very collaborative way. And then I'll just leave it with one final thing. If anybody on the call wants to have a quick conversation, I'm not going to be traveling for the foreseeable future. Uh, so I'm around. If anyone would like to have a quick call, I'm happy to just be a thinking partner for you. And then um, if you have an interest in that sort of break-even analysis that I ripped through pretty quickly <laughs> conversation, I'll put that into an Excel file and just email me and I'll, I'll get a copy into your hands. That way you can play with it. And maybe we can even grab it and get it on the, the head in the site as well. Uh, next yeah, to I'll, this. I'll, uh, I'll work on that. I'll create it today and then uh, send no it, pressure. Send it over to you. No, sorry. I'm, Thank I'm you. Over. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we're, we're at the uh, hour and uh, I want to thank um, all of you. Dave Collier, Garth Peterson, Trevor Stewart Hill. Um, you're men amongst men and um, we at Hedna on behalf of uh, Sebastian Leitner, the president and our membership, we really appreciate your time and support. And Garth, for leaving the lake, we really appreciate you adding that extra, extra layer of, of time for us. So thank you, gentlemen. Go wash your hands and have a great day. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you.